Hi everybody, Dennis Prager in my house. Is Otto in the scene here? Uh, yeah. Otto, say hello. All right, that's Otto's way of saying hello. Was that actually caught? You got, you got yeah. that? So this is a danger because he, he is more interesting than me, and, I, and I, I appreciate that fact. So I have to be interesting so as to overcome the competition from, from him. Okay, be that as it may, this is my home. Hello to you. It's great to be with you. I am stopped increasingly by people. I mean, I'm, I'm stopped, generally speaking, you know, with airports and so on. Which is, by the way, it never bothers me if you want to say hello when you see me. It's just fine. You want to get a selfie, that's also fine. Not an issue for me. I'm, I'm honored by it, actually. Uh, but uh, increasingly, people say that they, they know me primarily through the fireside chats. So that's a very gratifying thing. A young guy from Dublin saw me at the airport uh, last week and uh, watches, watches uh, the uh, videos, watches fireside chats back in Ireland. We have a big international audience. I want to say a special hello to those of you outside of the United States. It's whatever I have to say applies to everybody or it doesn't apply to anybody. I've always felt that way. I mean, there's no such thing as it only applies to and then fill in the name of a group. It's like Beethoven is only loved by Germans or Shakespeare is only loved by Englishmen. It's nonsense. If you have something important to say, it should be important to anybody. Okay, so before I get into today's topic and then take your questions, I want to show you a headline that, thanks to the Wall Street Journal pointing this out, from 1989, that's 30 years ago. Can we zoom in here? This is the Associated Press, June 29th, 1989, Associated Press. You got that? UN predicts disaster if global warming not checked. So let me just read to you a couple of paragraphs here. United Nations, Associated Press, AP, one of the biggest international news gathering organization. A senior UN environmental official says entire nations could be wiped off the face of the earth by rising sea levels if the global warming trend is not reversed by the year 2000. That was a while ago, the year 2000. There are a lot of you watching who weren't even born in 2000. <laughs> so... Uh, let's see. Coastal flooding and crop fails would create an exodus of eco-refugees, threatening political chaos, said Noel Brown, director of the New York office of the United Nations Environment Program, UNEP. Governments have a 10-year window, a 10-year window of opportunity to solve the greenhouse effect before it goes beyond human control. We are 20 years beyond human control. It's over. But nothing of, like this happened. And then this, uh, uh, this American congresswoman, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, tells us in 12 years it's all over. But they said in 10 years it's all over 30 years ago. I don't deny that the earth is getting warmer. I deny that there's a reason to be panicked about it. There's a big difference. There's hysteria. In my book, uh, the, uh, Still the Best Hope, I document 11 hysterias just in my lifetime. Hysterias like this, none of which came true. So I'm a little, uh, I am a little uh, suspicious, shall we say, when I hear it's coming to an end. As I always said, if a, uh, if a religious person says the world is coming to an end, we call him a fanatic. If a secular person says the world is coming to an end, we call him an environmentalist. Right? I mean, you know the old joke about the guy walking around the earth, the world is coming to an end, some religious guy on the street with a sign, and we think he's a nut. But if he's secular, oh, then he's listening to 97% of scientists who don't say the world is coming to an end. They simply say it's getting warmer, if indeed 97% say that. Anyway, you should, re you should read this. I'm going to put this up on my, uh, on, my, on my Twitter. I don't tweet much, but I should. 
uh, stuff like this. This is important that you have. So just remember, 30 years ago, they warned that we had 10 years before it was pretty much all over. So when you hear it's going to be all over, I watch these kids. They, we just had this march of kids all over the world. Oh, we saved the world, saved the world. Some nine-year-old made a video and, and, and adults were, were just so worried this kid thinks the world. I feel sorry for every one of you young people who think the world is coming to an end in your lifetime because of global warming. I feel bad for you. You've been spooked. Have a happy life. I have much greater worries. I have worry about the decline of the Western world, which gave us human rights. That, that worries me much more than carbon emissions. Oh, and by the way, there's one more proof that this is hysteria. They're not for, they're not for nuclear power. Nuclear power is completely safe. Complete clean, utterly clean, as clean as carbon, excuse me, as clean as, as, um, as sun and wind. But they're not for it because they're spooked out by that too. Shows their, their hysterics. Anyone who is crazed about global warming but is not for nuclear power is a nut, is a fanatic. Just so you'll know that. So uh, all of you young folks watching... Don't worry. This is a hysteria. So it doesn't mean we don't address it or we don't do all sorts of uh, scientific uh, innovations with regard to energy. All oh, that's great. But the, 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 new, the green and new, uh, new deal, that would bankrupt our civilization. And that would really lead to horrors. Horrors. Including terrible violence. All right. So I want to talk to you about college. Uh, those of you outside the United States may not be aware of the fact that uh, very recently uh, some very high-profile wealthy people and people in Hollywood were caught bribing coaches and others at uh, Stanford and Yale and USC and other universities to get their kid into one of these uh, prestigious universities. And I'm not going to even address the obvious, the immorality of, of doing that. Now, that's obvious. But there's something infinitely deeper here. Why, do, why are parents crazed about what college their kid goes to? There's no good reason. No good reason. It's overwhelmingly so that they can boast to their friends and others, my kid goes to Yale. To which my response is, whoopee do. So what? Is your kid a good kid? Is your kid mature? Does your kid have good values? Does your kid have common sense? Does your kid have any wisdom? Is your kid kind? All of those are infinitely more important than what college your kid goes to, or even if your kid goes to college. Now, if you're going to go to medical school, you got to go to college. I understand you can't study biology in your, in, 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 in your house. I understand that. Okay, that's fine. But I'm not going to even address the issue whether to go to college or not. I'll do that another time. I just want to address the issue. It doesn't matter what college you go to. I know the data, believe me, I've studied all of this. Oh, well, if you go to Princeton or Harvard or Yale or Stanford or Oxford or whatever it is, then you make X hundred thousand dollars more in the first few years or in the first 10 years, whatever it is. Maybe it's true. By the way, there, there are a lot. It depends on what you majored in there. It's, it's, it's not obvious at all. By the way, do you know that of the 500 U.S. born Heads of the top 500 companies, um, 30 went to a prestigious college. 30 out of 500. Where did Howard Schultz go? The guy who founded uh, Starbucks? I believe it's Ithaca College or something? Or no, no, we we Western Michigan University. I don't remember what it was, but it it's not in the ranks of, of, the, of the prestigious. By the way, when we hire at PragerU, we don't give a hoot well, what college you went to. I'm not sure we even give a hoot if you went to college. Are you mature? Hey, you got good values? Common sense? Easy to get along with? 
Uh, it's a hell of a lot more important than uh, what college you went to. By the way, I have my. Uh, you should read my column this week. It's titled. Uh, uh, let me. What is it? So your child goes to uh, Yale. So what? You should read it. And uh, I wrote in there because I and I mentioned University of Wyoming because I lectured at the University of Wyoming uh, last year or year the year before. And by the way, it's, it's a lecture you should watch. How socialism makes people selfish. Very, very important lecture, if I may say that myself. Not because I gave it, but because it is. And I really fell in love with Wyoming and, I, and a lot of the kids there. And I wrote, if I were hiring 100 kids blind, I knew nothing about them, 100 from Yale I could take, or 100 from the University of Wyoming, in a heartbeat I would take the 100 from the University of Wyoming. There's not even a question about it. And I wrote, a, I wrote four reasons. I don't remember. I don't know if I remember them uh, uh, by heart, or offhand. But uh, first of all, they're far less likely to think they're God's gift to mankind. Kids who go to Harvard. Let, let me make it clear. There are nice, fine kids who go to Harvard and Stanford. I understand that. But all things being equal, uh, very few kids at the University of Wyoming or where I went to college, Brooklyn College, think that they are the creme de la creme of the universe because they're at the University of Wyoming or Brooklyn College. It was a good thing. It was a, it was a nice, humbling thing. I, I, I had to live at home. We didn't have enough money for me to go to, uh, to, to, uh, to sleep somewhere else. And I, so I, I, I took the bus every day, or excuse me, the subway every day. I don't remember, or bus and subway every day to Brooklyn College. I ended up at Columbia for graduate school, but I left that after two years. So that doesn't count. Well, it counts, but it doesn't count because we're talking about undergraduate in any event. Uh, but it didn't matter. It didn't matter. I'm very happy I went there. I didn't think the world of myself. Nobody, nobody at Brooklyn College thought the world of himself because you were at Brooklyn College or the University of Wyoming or, or Western Michigan University, if there is such a thing, or whatever it might be. So that's one reason. Another one is they're probably, they're probably uh, working as well as going to school. At the, uh, the hundred kids from University of Wyoming are probably also having a job, whereas the kids at Yale are probably not. They're either on scholarship or they, they come from a wealthy home, and, and they're probably not working. And kids who work uh, are, do better. It's a very responsible way to live. And uh, a whole bunch of reasons why I would take the hundred from the, among other reasons is I would think, I think their values would be more intact. A hundred kids from Yale probably think the United States is a scummy society. I'm sorry to use the word, but that's what they're really told at all, all the prestigious colleges. Whereas the kids at the University of Wyoming probably think they're very lucky to, to, to live in America. That's a big difference if you think poor me or lucky me. Big difference in character, happiness, maturity, you name it. So this notion, you got to get into a great college, it's parents' fault. It is. Parents drive their kids crazy to get great grades. Well, <laughs> this always cracks me up when I'm driving and there's a, there's a sticker on the back of, some, uh, of the car I'm behind. Uh, my kid is on the da-da-da-da school's honor roll. And I'm thinking, poor kid. God, would I be embarrassed if my parent had a, uh, had a bumper sticker announcing that I was on the honor roll. It's so infantilizing, and it's, it, and it's so reductive. That's what it is. How about, hey, how about my kid is, is kind? <laughs> I'll take that. Or my kid honors his parents. I think that's more important than my kid is on the honor roll. How do you treat your parents is of infinitely greater importance than whether you made the honor roll. I felt this when I was a kid. I knew that my parents, by the way, didn't agree. My parents thought I would uh, uh, end up in jail or, or otherwise a loser because I didn't get good grades in high school. But I told them why I didn't get good grades because I really didn't think it was important what college I went to. Oddly enough, I believed that then and I believe this now. My life just turned out pretty okay, by the way. Professionally, intellectually, I've got nine books that I've written that are pretty serious, pretty serious journals, I was going to say, but they're books, they're not journals. 
So uh, I, 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 I'm telling you the biggest reason uh, happens to be that parents want to be able to say, my kid goes to. That's selfish. And I'll tell you what else it is. If, if parents are watching this, that's your claim to fame? You, that's, the, that's what gives your life sustenance and meaning? What college your kid goes to? Not the character of your child? So here's a very simple rule. Tell your kids, I don't care about your grades nearly as much as I care about your character. That's what you should... I told my kids that probably every week of their lives. And by the way, they didn't get good grades. <laughs> it's true. They were okay. Not, not great grades. And hopefully, uh, they're, good, they're good human beings today. But they would certainly know, if you ask them, what did your father emphasize? And they would have said character. Honesty, decency, etc., etc. I, I didn't really care what grades they had. I was abnormal as a parent, especially upper middle class parent. That, that's really abnormal. I admit it. But I've always been very clear on what matters in life. And that was clear to me. I had no desire to say, oh, my, my kid's at uh, Columbia. My kid's at, you name it. It, it. So what? So so what? Does it mean you were a good parent? Does it mean you were a good parent? A good parent produces a good person. Good student and good person is not the same thing. Or, to be precise, are not the same thing. That's what parents need to know, and that's what you need to know if you're being driven crazy on this issue. Read good and important books. Yes. Read important things. Learn, study. Oh, I love the world of the mind. My antipathy to school, had, or, or to the importance of school, was not an antipathy to learning. I'm crazy about learning. And I'm not sure schools cultivate people who are crazy about learning. Okay, that's my message to you today. Time for your questions. Uh, David27, who is both in the UK and Poland. Hi, David. Why isn't communism regarded as bloodthirsty as fascism? Don't I have a... Don't, don't I have a, um, a PragerU video on that? Either, I, you want to quickly take a look? I think I have a PragerU video. Why don't people hate communism as much as, uh, as Nazism? I believe there's a, there's a five-minute uh, video that I made. I certainly know that I've written this up, and you can find it on the Internet. I wrote a column on this. It is? It's a video? Why isn't communism as hated as Nazism? Why isn't communism as hated as Nazism? Because the left writes our history books. That's the reason. Oh, there are many reasons I give. It's not the only reason. And it's because the Nazis created the Holocaust, the most unique crime in history. That's, that's all, uh, those are all reasons. But in terms of sheer uh, magnitude of, of death... Communism dwarfs anything that ever existed in the history of the world. In China alone, 80 million. Soviet Union, between 25 and 40 million. But, you know, they, they say Stalin said, one, one death is a tragedy, a million is a statistic. So when I give these numbers, you're not falling off your chair crying. And I don't, I, I'm, I'm not blaming you. The human capacity to relate to one person's death is much greater than to a million people's deaths. Because we would go crazy if we could truly understand the magnitude of suffering that those numbers embrace. But it's a very terrible thing that we don't know how bad, how evil, how vile. And I'm not, that's just the people that they murdered. They enslaved a billion. To live under communism is to be a slave period. So this is a tragedy. I mean, you know that uh, I think where I live in Los Angeles, California, USA, I think there's a, there's a Mao cafe. 
and Che Guevara t-shirts. People wear Che Guevara t-shirts. It's astonishing. Is anybody wearing a Heinrich Himmler t-shirt? Or an Adolf Eichmann t-shirt? Or, 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 or a Hitler t-shirt? It's a, it's a terrible problem that you just raised. Terrible. And part of it is ignorance. People should read any of the you know any of the books about what the communists did. Read the Red Famine. Just read what the what the, the Russians did, the Soviets, to um, the communists did to, to to the Ukrainians. Chloe, eighteen years old, Florida. How has feminism affected young men? Well, I think I spoke about this here. I'm not sure, but. You might as well ask as well, how has it affected young women? And it's had a devastating impact on both sexes. Among other things, it, 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 it uh, propounded the theory that men and women are basically the same, which is not only ridiculous, it's terribly harmful. So it's one of the reasons that, uh, you know, girls go to college and they, and they, two things happen. One is they think that if they try to find a husband, they're really betraying their womanhood. Because a woman should not even think about marriage at such an age. She should be thinking uh, about career. But it's actually a pretty good idea for a woman to think about marriage at an early age because she, she just has a better chance of getting a wonderful man. It's just a fact. It's, it's not an opinion. It's not a condemnation. It's just a fact. A Princeton woman wrote this in the New York Times, I believe, a couple of years ago. You might want to look it up. That That's exactly when a woman should most be looking for a good man. Because good men don't grow on trees. By the way, good women don't grow on trees either. Good people don't grow on trees. So it's hurt, it's hurt women in that. It's hurt them sexually because, hey, I'm just like a man. I, I, I can enjoy a, uh, you know, a one-night stand just as much as guys can. And uh, they find that, well, there are some women who can. It's absolutely correct. Nothing is true for everybody. But for most women, it's not true. And it's one of the reasons uh, for the depression uh, rates among young women, which are far higher than they were a generation earlier. So if feminism has uh, hurt both sexes, has it done any good? I always get a kick out of that question. Well, Dennis, hasn't feminism done any good? Hasn't you just name it done any good? There is nothing that has ever been invented that didn't do any good. <laughs> Everything did some good. You don't judge things on, did they do any good? You judge them on, did they do more bad or more good? And feminism did more bad. Yes, it did some good, but it did more bad. And it's hurt both sexes. That's exactly right. Okay. Jerry, 24 in Nashville. Can I be, or Nashville? Don't you guys say Nashville? No? No. Nashville. They say Nashville? So where is Vol? There's some city where they say Vol. Oh. Can I be a good leader in a relationship where the woman is very controlling? Why would you want to be in a relationship with a man or a woman who's very controlling? Forget good leader. <laughs> you can't be happy with somebody who's very controlling, <laughs> male or female. It's so interesting that I understand if once you're married, you have kids, you don't want a divorce. I totally get it. So, you, you know, you just stick it out. I understand. By the way, I'm not sure everybody should stick it out either. That's a separate issue. Uh, but... Nevertheless, if you're not married, why would you stay with someone who's controlling? And, and, and why would anybody want to control anybody else? You know, I have, I, like every human being, I've got my you know, dark side and bad instincts and so on. But I got to admit, controlling any human being has never been one of them. Uh, I, you know, I have a tough enough time controlling me. That's what I should do. People should control themselves. Then we'll have a better world. Control somebody else. Whew. 
So I don't what, 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 the question is so it's like an it's like rocket science when it's not rocket science. You just don't want to be with a man or a woman who's very controlling. Okay. How are we doing on Timesville? 25. Good. Calvin, 14, New Hampshire. This is a different question. Is a robot that fixes other robots a doctor or an engineer? That's funny. A robot that fixes other robots is a robot <laughs> and remains a robot forever. It might be performing the functions of one or the other. Obviously, it's not a doctor because doctors work on, on living beings, right? Veterinarians are doctors of animals and physicians are doctors of people. But uh, it's, it's hard to say that a robot is an engineer. It might be, in fact, functioning. Uh, it might be engaging in the functions of an engineer. That, that I, 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 can, I can buy that. That's a, it's a, but it's a fun question. Okay, Ryan, 31, Virginia. If the word of God doesn't say to discipline your child, how would we know it's a good thing? Well, putting aside the specifics of disciplining a child, which is very important, unbelievably important. I was telling someone just maybe yesterday even that children need, I should do a, I should do a thing on this. Children need parents to make boundaries more than they even need parental love. I'll tell you why. Because children are at their worst when they don't feel secure. If they don't feel loved, okay, that's unfortunate. But if they don't feel, if, in other words, a child who feels First of all, a child who feels secure pretty much feels, in some sense, loved. Security for a child is co-equal in, in many ways. But, but even, let's say, kid doesn't feel particularly loved. Uh, by the way, that, to be honest, that was me. I didn't particularly feel loved by my parents, but I was incredibly secure. And that, that turned out to be more important. Parents today give a lot of love but they don't give a lot of security because they don't give boundaries. Boundaries are what make for security. You can't, we, we're going to give you guardrails. You can't go over that. Children know, they, they don't know it consciously, but they know they, they need to be disciplined because they are wild. So yes, uh, since... Uh, we have, since Western societies rejected its single greatest source of wisdom for its first 1900 years, the Bible, uh, I, we, we are living in an increasingly stupid age. That's just a fact. The amount of idiocy that I was taught in college was astonishing. Like men and women are basically the same. Give me a break. And now they're taught men and women don't even exist. It's all subjective. But anyway, uh, I don't know how people would know a, a lot of things if they didn't have the Bible to guide them. I know if you're secular, this sounds crazy. But I always, I've done shows on this on my radio show. If, if you don't use the Bible, where do you get your wisdom from? You know what people answer? Honest, nice people calling up. Oh, I get it from my own human experience. Oh, really? So you reinvent the wheel all the time. How are you going to know all of these things at 20 when you've had no experience to speak of? Whereas a kid who at least like I did, I had the Bible. I had, I had a lot of wisdom by 20. Not because I'm terrific, but because I was taught terrific. Uh, Adam, 32, Delaware. Favorite economist? Um, two come to mind. Who was the one I was just telling you about? Milton. Milton Friedman and Tom Sowell. I mean, those are the ones that immediately come to mind. There were certainly other good ones. Tom Sowell is living, and uh, uh, Milton Friedman has passed on. He, he got a Nobel Prize for economics. Tom Sowell should have gotten one. 
Tom Sowell would be, and probably would be the best known black in America if he were uh, a liberal. He is, he is one of the most brilliant people of any race uh, in, the, in, in the society. All of his books are, are treasures. I just had him on the show the other day. I think he's in his late 80s now, and he's as uh, alive and vibrant as at any time in his life. S-O-W-E-L-L and Milton Friedman. I wonder if either of them are taught at most colleges now. All right, I think we're good. So, uh, d- definitely read the column on So Your Kid Goes to Yale, So What? <laughs> and you could pre-order my next volume in my five-volume commentary on the Bible called The Rational Bible. If it doesn't uh, change your life and affect you deeply, then I have failed. But it is intended to. Read the reviews on Amazon. None of which, obviously, I ever cultivated. I don't know the people who wrote the reviews. But see how it has touched their lives. It's called the Rational Bible. It's very important because we're living in an age of confusion. There's a lot of good stuff there. Well then, until I meet you at the airport uh, or, uh, or some restaurant, thank you for being with me. I'm Dennis Prager, and I'll see you next week. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to keep these fireside chats free, please do by donating to PragerU.